Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for just revealing yourself through this worship, Lord. Now, as we dive into your word, Lord, prepare our hearts, Lord. Open our hearts, Lord. Strip us from what needs to be stripped. Break us so that we can be better servants for you, Lord. Thank you for your wonderful son, Jesus Christ, who came to this earth to die for all of our sins, Lord. In his precious holy name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Hope y'all have had a great time of worship so far. John Piper once said, I hear so many Christians murmuring about their imperfections and their failures and their addiction and their shortcomings. And I see so little war. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Why am I this way? Make war. I hear so many Christians in this country that continue to complain about the state it's in. That continue to murmur how sin is running amok. And I see so little war. Halesford, are you ready to be the church that steps forward and declare war on sin upon this country? But before we even can look at the state of this country, we need to look at ourselves and see what sin we need to declare a war, declare war on in our own lives. You know, we're going up against things in this day of age that are defying what God has to say, are defying what the Bible has to say. And are we part of the solution? Are we standing behind God's word? Are we being authentic Christians? Are we part of the problem? Are we living for ourselves, living for our sinful desires? No, we're going up against issues today like abortion, Marriage, racism, gender, and the list can keep going and going of how many issues we're facing right now. You know, Melvin once said in his sermon that back in the 1960s, that they decided to take prayer and the Ten Commandments out of school. They crossed the line, church. And what did the church do? They simply just stepped back and said, okay, okay. A couple of years later, the issue of abortion came up. But they wanted to take the precious life of a baby and say, it's okay to kill it. And what did the church do? They simply stepped back. Years later, the issue of marriage came up. That is no longer between a man and a woman, what is sacred and what God has made beautiful and pure. He said it could be between a man and a man or a woman and a woman. And what did the church do? Simply step back. How much longer are we going to continue to step back? When are we finally going to say enough is enough and step forward? When are we going to step forward in our own lives? Declare war upon sin, your temptation, your addiction. When is enough finally going to be enough? When are you finally going to declare war? No, it's so sad in this country that I see Christians that go around. They take God's word and they go around and Bible thump others. And the sad part is they have never even opened up God's word themselves and actually read what it has to say. They're going around slaying people in Jesus' name. But that sword was never ours to swing. We have too many Christians that go around on social media or hide behind social media 
They're like what I call the Facebook Christian. They talk such a big game, but their lives do not match up their talk. One minute they're praising God and his glory. The next minute they're cursing out their neighbor for something. We need, this country needs authentic Christians. This church needs authentic Christians. Hells for Baptist needs authentic Christians. Not counterfeits, not fakes, but authentic Christians. We need Christians that seek God each and every day in their personal life. And are we preparing ourselves that way right now? Are we spending time with God each and every day? Are we spending time in prayer each and every day? Are we spending time in his word each and every day? Are we being faithful in these small things? Or are we just wanting to live in the public spotlight of Christianity? Then soon we sink back into the shadows and live a whole different other kind of life. We cannot live nor prepare ourselves each and every week by just seeking God on Sunday. Too many people come to the church on Sunday and pig out like it's a buffet so it can make it last the next Sunday. But when Saturday comes around, they are spiritually starving. That is not how Christ has called us to live. We need to seek him every single day and prepare ourselves by seeking him. So when your sin, when your temptation, when your addiction comes knocking at your door, you are prepared to declare war on it and through Christ you can overcome it. We need to prepare ourselves. Now, back in high school, I I played football. If you actually believe that, I did. And when I signed up to do it, I, really, I realized how unprepared I actually was on. I, I really didn't know what I was signed up for. I remember the first day I set out to go to practice, I realized in that moment how small I actually am. I got a picture of, right, look, see, that, that's me, and that was like half the linemen. Like, I, I, I was really tiny. I had no, I, I got scared when I stepped out there. I was like, oh, Taylor, what, what do you, have you signed yourself up for? You know, I went out to become the field goal kicker. I thought, that's, that'll be an easy job. You get to score every time you go in the game. It'll be easy. So Coach Jones, he, he's a, him and his family are a member here at our church. They go to the late service, and he was one of the greatest coaches I ever had. And he called for special teams, and I ran up to do my field goal. I'm like, oh, this is going to be easy. You know, it's like the size of a barn. You know, how hard is it to get that ball through that? So I stepped back, and when I went up to kick, they snapped it. I kicked, and I looked up, and it, it, it didn't go through. It went right back in the behind of the guy that snapped the ball. <laughs> and all these huge guys turn around and look at me. I'm like, oh. I'm like, I'm sorry. Let me, let me try again. So I, I stepped back, and I went and kicked again. And the same exact thing happened again. It went right back to the behind of the snapper. Coach Jones pulled me aside and said, uh, Chris, uh, see, he, he kind of scared me. I, for a year and a half, I didn't actually tell him my name was Taylor. <laughs> he just called me Chris. <laughs> he goes, Chris, come here. I'm like, yes, sir. He goes, I'm, I'm afraid to tell you, but you, uh, you kind of stink at this. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I do. He goes, all right, this is what I want you to do. He goes, I want you to go over there and practice. I want you to go there and practice because kick until when you get it down, you can come over here and practice with the team. And then when you can practice with the team and do perfect here, then I can use you in the game. I'm like, all right. So I went over and practiced. It took about, uh, quite a few months to actually get it down. Then I actually got to practice with the team. Then after I got that down, later on in the year, he could use me in the game. He could confidently put me in knowing that I could do my job because I had prepared myself. I had practice. No, practice doesn't make perfect, but perfect practice does. We should be practicing perfectly and seeking God so when the time comes, we can perform perfectly through him. If you have your Bibles today, we're going to be in Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 16 and 17. This is one of my favorite stories in the Bible. We all know it. It's the story of David and Goliath. Most of the time we see or think about the story, we think about a small boy going up against a giant. 
We see this story as a reference of overcoming your giants or do not mess with the little guy. But have you actually broke down the story and read it for yourself? It's a story of preparing. It's a story of not a boy, but a young man who declared war and stepped forward on the battle lines. So in 1 Samuel 16, chapter 1, verse 1, it says, The Lord said to Samuel, How long are you going to mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem because I have selected a king from his son. See, Saul has lost favor with God. So he sends Samuel to Bethlehem because he has chosen a king to come from Bethlehem. So Samuel sets off and heads to Bethlehem and he comes to the town. He tells, I come in peace. He approaches Jesse and he says, Jesse, would you come and do your sacrifice with me? Bring, Bring your sons with me. So they set out and Samuel says in verses, it says in verse six, it says, when they arrived, Samuel saw Elab and said, certainly the Lord's anointed one is here before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his stature because I have rejected him. Man does not see what the Lord sees for man sees what is visible, but the Lord sees the heart. Church, where is your heart today? Are you placing it in Christ? Are you placing it in God and let him use you in great and mighty ways? Are you placing it in the world? Are you placing it in your sinful desires? No, God wants to use you. He wants to use you in a mighty way, but he can't if you're placing it in the world. If you're living a life of sin. So Samuel, he starts going through his son and God's rejecting each and every single one of them. And finally he runs out of sons. He looks at Jesse and goes, Jesse, do you have any other boys, any whatsoever? And Jesse goes, yeah, I got my youngest, David. He's out tending the sheep right now. Samuel said, bring him here. Bring him to me. It says in verses 12, so Jesse sent for him. And he, being David, had beautiful eyes and a healthy and handsome appearance. And the Lord said, anoint him, for he is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord took control of David from that day forward. And Samuel set out and went to Raham. We see right here that David is anointed as a king at a very young age. God has a calling in your life right now. Now, God has a plan in your life and he wants to do something great through each and every single one of you, just like he did for David. Now, David, David was a shepherd throughout the younger parts of his life. His job was to protect the sheep and defend them when wild animals came around. Soon after this happened, the spirit of the Lord had left Saul. He soon became tormented by evil spirits. And he said, I need someone. I need someone to soothe me. I need someone that can play music. And in verse 17, it says, one of Saul's servants, uh, he's commanded one of his servants, he said, find me someone who plays well and bring him to me. In 18, one of the young men answered, I have seen a son of Jesse of Bethlehem who knows how to play the lyre. He's also a valiant man, a warrior, eloquent, handsome, and the Lord is with them. We see David is all of these things before he even approaches the battlefield against Goliath. Valiant, possessing or showing courage or determination, a warrior, a brave or experienced soldier or fighter, eloquent, fluent or persuasive and speaking or writing, handsome and the Lord is with him. And he came and Saul fell in love with David. And soon after that, Saul made David his armor bearer. An armor bearer is one who carried a large shield to protect the king in battle and also carried other weapons for the king. They were also responsible for killing enemies wounded by their master. We see, we don't get this picture of a little boy doing all this. We, pic- we get a picture of a young man. 
You know, they, call, they call him a youth. A youth back then was someone around the age, you know, of their late teenagers or early 20s. So we get into chapter 17, David and Goliath. And we see here the Israelites are at war with the Philistines. And the Philistines had a great warrior. They had a great champion named Goliath. Goliath weighed between 600 to 700 pounds. He was nine feet and nine inches tall. His armor weighed around 125 to 175 pounds. His spearhead alone weighed 15 pounds. And we see in verse 8, it says he stood and shouted to the Israelites who were in battle formation, why do you come out to the line up in battle formation? He asked them. Am I not a Philistine and are you not a servant of Saul? Choose one of your men and have them come down against me. If he wins in a fight against me and kills me, we will be your servants. But if I win against him and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. Then the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel today. Send me a man so we can fight each other. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words from the Philistine, they lost courage and were terrified. For 40 days, Goliath did this, taunted them, terrified them. How many days do you wake up in the morning and your sin, your addiction, your temptation taunts you? And how many times do you stand back terrified of it? Soon, you see Jesse, who sends David to feed his brothers who are at battle. And David sees Goliath when he gets there. He sees him cursing the Israelites. And he sees that no one is taking a stand. Previously, David over overheard a conversation. Previously, in verse 25, it said, Previously, an Israelite man had declared... Do you see this man who keeps coming out? He comes out to defy Israel. The king will make the man who kills him very rich and will give him his daughter. The king will also make the household of the man's father exempt from paying taxes in Israel. And David's like, wait, wait, wait. So you, let me get this straight. If you go out and kill this guy, you get all this. Like, yeah. He goes, and why aren't you? And they're like, well, uh, he's kind of, you know, big. He's like, but he's just one man. Just one man. Why are y'all terrified? And then soon David's brothers overhear him and they kind of hear what he's trying to do. And they're like, David, go home. Just go home. You're not meant to be here. Go home. You know, if I was one of David's brothers, I'd be kind of upset too if I got rejected to become a king of Israel. But they're trying to, Get him to go home. And David goes, no, why, why are y'all doing anything? In verse 31, he said, what David said was overheard and reported to Saul. So he, and Dave, so he had David brought to him. And David said to Saul, do not let anyone be discouraged by him. Your servant will go out and fight this Philistine. In verse 33, it said, But Saul replied, You can't go out and fight this Philistine. You are just a youth. And he's been a warrior since he was young. He's not telling David that it's just because you're a little boy. It's because this warrior has been fighting a lot longer than you have, David. He is trained. He has prepared many more hours than you have. You're just getting started. You will be no match for him. In 34, David answered Saul, he said, your servant has been tending his father's sheep. Whenever a lion or a bear came and carried off a lamb from the flock, I went after it and struck it down and rescued the lamb from its mouth. If it reared up against me, I would grab it by its fur and strike it down and kill it. 
Your servant has killed lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Then David said, The Lord who has rescued me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will rescue me from the hands of this Philistine. David has wrestled with bear and killed him, killed it with his bare hands. He has wrestled with lions and killed them with his bare hands. Have y'all ever seen a lion and a bear before? They're huge. And this young man has killed them with his bare hands. God has done that through David. He's prepared him through that to all up for this moment right here in his life. Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. So David's getting ready for battle and Saul brings him his best armor and he starts putting on, da- he starts putting it on David and David starting to walk around. He realizes he's not used to it. It's not because the armor's too big and falling off. It's just because he has not, not, never been used to wearing a soldier's army. That'll be like us trying to put on a soldier's armor today. We wouldn't be used to walking around and he goes, no, no, I, I, I don't need this. I don't need this. So he goes out and he takes his sling and he goes down to the creek of the river and grab, grabs five stones. You know, a lot of preachers and theologians think that these five stones represent something. It probably does. I just, I don't know what it represents. They argue all the time what it represents. But in my theory, it's kind of like this. Who in here is a hunter? Did anyone in here hunt? Raise your hand. Who in here hunts? Oh, we got, a quite, we got a quite a few hunters. Okay, okay, okay. When you go hunting, do you just take one bullet with you? Do you? No. You take, take quite a handful because just in case you miss that shot, you can load up again and fire another one down range. And that's what David did. He's going in prepared. And he surpasses the Israelites who are standing on the battle line, and steps forward. And Goliath sees David, and he begins to laugh at him, begins to curse at him, because he was just a youth. You're sending me a young man to come out to fight me? (laughs) He's thinking this is going to be easy. Verse 43, it said, he said to David, am I a dog that you come against me with sticks? Then he cursed David by his gods. Come here, the Philistine called to David, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts. But David had a reply. David said to the Philistine in verse 45, he said, you come against me with a dagger, a spear, and a sword, but I come against you in the name of Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel's armies. You have defied him. Today, the Lord will hand you over to me. Today, I'll strike you down, cut your head off, and give the corpses of the Philistines camp to the bird of the skies and the creatures of the earth then the whole world will know that Israel has a God. And this whole assembly will know it's not by the sword or by the spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will hand you over to us. And this infuriates Goliath. You know what Goliath does? He takes off in a mad dash towards David, screaming, cursing, threatening him. And you know what David does? David takes off in a dash towards Goliath. And you see these two, they're about to collide. But David pulls out a stone from his satchel and begins to crank up. One, two, three, and he lets it go. And when that rock, when that stone comes out of the sling, there's a loud crack. You know what that crack is? It's a sonic boom because that rock is coming out so fast, it's breaking the speed of sound. And that rock, that stone takes off and David only had about a three millimeter target and he drills the target right on. That stone sinks deep into Goliath's 
forehead, crushing his skull, and he falls to the ground dead. And David runs up and he takes Goliath's own sword and cuts his head off and he holds it up and the whole entire assembly begin to roar with cheer because they knew in that moment that Israel had a God. They just witnessed a huge miracle. They witnessed what God did between, for this young man. It wasn't the stone, it wasn't the sling that killed Goliath, but the power of a living God. David killed Goliath. David defeated the giant because he was prepared and had confidence in God. God prepared David by having him shepherd and protect the sheep so that one day he would be able to shepherd and protect the Israelites. David proved God in private and God used him a great, in a great way publicly. So how long are you just going to sit here just like the Israelites and do nothing? Are we going to just sit back and continue to let the people and the government of this country to continue to spit and defy our God? Are you just going to continue to sit there and let your sin, your temptation, your addiction keep defying you? What is it going to take? What is it finally going to take for us to finally say enough is enough? We need to approach the battle lines just like David did and declare war on sin, on this country, that sin upon this country and the sin upon your own life. Because no matter how big it is, no matter how scary it is, no matter how, ter- how much terrified you are, our God is bigger. You know, I love this story. You know, you know why I love this story so much? Because this story is a foreshadowing. This story is giving us a glimpse of what is about to come in the New Testament. We see in the New Testament, another king is born in Bethlehem. And it's just not the king of Israel. It's the king of kings, the king of all nations, the king of heaven. Jesus Christ. And just like how David set out to do the will of his father, Jesus came down to to do the will of his. We see Christ grow up seeking God every day. Living by example. Later, we see this young man come to deliver us from sin. And we see us. Because just like how the Israelites shook with fear and felt enslaved to the Philistines, we see us who are enslaved to our sin and fear of it. And as we step back, shaking in fear, the Son of God steps forward into our place to take on this giant. The one that is prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice for us. He steps forward, not a sling or a sword or a spear, but for my cross and your cross. He steps forward with it on his shoulders and begins to head up towards Calvary. And laying down his life, a wage on sin, a wage on death, a war was waged in the grave. And we see three days later, he rose again. And in doing that, he defeated death and won the battle against sin. In Genesis 3.15, it says, he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And that is what Christ did. Just how David cut the head off Goliath, Jesus cut the head off of sin. Sin has no power on you, nor does it have bondage over you if you are in Christ. Sin does not have resurrecting power. So why are we continuing to live in it? Why do we keep placing ourselves in this bondage if it's already been overcome? Declare war on it. What, what sin has you, a hold of you today sitting here? Is it gossip? 
Are you someone that goes around and takes down your brother or sister in Christ? You slander their name. Why? To make yourself feel good? All it causes is hurt and pain. We should be, be building each other up. We should be not condemning nor judging, but loving each other. Because we're all in this together. Could you imagine what it would be if we all came together and see what God can do? Instead of tearing each other down, we should build each other up daily. Is gossip the sin you struggle with? Declare war on it. Is it pornography? Are you someone that's addicted and you feel like you're too far gone and it feels like it has a hold on your life and you don't feel like you can never overcome it? I'm telling you, you can overcome it through Christ. Declare war on it. Are you an alcoholic? Declare war on it. Are you addicted to drugs? Declare war on it. No matter what type of sin has a hold of you today, declare war on it. Are you strong and confident in God that he can deliver you from your temptation? Are you prepared? Are you seeking him each and every day to fight this battle? Matthew 6, 33 says, but first, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek him. Seek God every single day pray with God each and every day spend time in his word each and every day you want to see God back in this country you want to see him do great and mighty things the first step is to put him back in our lives that's the first step you want to see great things done it starts with you it starts with me and you have the choice the choice the choice is yours you can either sit back Shake in fear of sin, just like the Israelites did with Goliath. Or you can be a David. Prepare yourself. Seek God every day and step forward on the battle line and declare war on it. And when you declare war, God is our armor bearer. And he'll protect you all the way. No matter how big your sin is, he will be there to block the blows for you. And you will overcome it through him. I hope everyone today, you know, has accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Maybe that's the first step for you today is accepting Christ as your Lord and Savior. Because just like he did for me and many of us in here, he came down to this world to take on our sins and he died for them so you do not have to live in it anymore so that you can experience the full grace of God and spend eternity with him in heaven. Maybe that's your first step today. Maybe you're someone in here that you're, you're saved but you're, 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 you're struggling. You, you found yourself back into your old ways and you just feel like you're, you're just in bondage of this sin. The first step to overcoming that is falling to your knee saying, God, I cannot overcome this. I need you to do this because you and I are no matches for the power of hell. You and I are no match for the power of sin, temptation, and our addiction. But you can overcome that through Christ. He will pull you through and you can have victory through him over it. The song of invitation is, near the heart of God, 295. So as we get ready to sing, let's pray to see where God wants you to, to see what you need to overcome. And if you need to make that decision to accept Christ, our pastors will be here at the altar to stand with you. Dear Lord, just thank you so much for revealing to us your word, Lord. Thank you so much for sending your son to take on this giant called sin and overcame it. I pray for each and every person here today that they
they don't have to feel in bondage anymore, that you can take that from them. I pray for if anyone here doesn't know you as your personal Savior, they come to know you today, Lord. In Jesus' precious name I pray, amen.